will start in one minute. I've seen that done uh, many times, but never succeeded. We're not too many. So if you want to come in front, you're welcome. It will feel warmer for everyone, me included. It actually works. Thank you, people. Much appreciated. So this talk is really about something I discovered, which is just a one-liner. Being a contributor is really powerful, more than you can imagine. And so I'm going to uh, explain that in the context of Upstream University, which is really a big name for a one training course. This is my hobby, a very time-consuming hobby. It has been for a year. Uh, it's the, uh, also the professional occupation of Adolfo Brandes, the executive director of this tiny university with a single course. And in order to explain this single course, I will tell you what I mean exactly by contributor and by upstream. Uh, explaining that through my experience as an upstream and as a contributor. And then, uh, I will take an example of what is a very small contribution and what is a very large contribution, namely the sailometer uh, component of OpenStack, which is a contribution to OpenStack that was started uh, back in March 2012. And then to show how a training course can help fill the gap between a very small contribution and a very large one, how you can speed up the process I will explain how we designed the course of Upstream University, and that will be it. That's the course. If you're here uh, because you want technical tips on how to become a better uh, OpenStack contributor, it won't be it. I will not disclose technical uh, tricks that will make you all of a sudden a very successful contributor. It's mostly about soft skills and social things. Is it okay with everyone? Yep. Okay, nobody leaving the room? Thank you. So an upstream is someone who controls distribution. I take the image of a dam. Let's imagine that every patch, every potential patch to a software, let's say to OpenStack, is a drop behind the dam. Then the upstream is the guy who controls uh, the gates of the dam and let a, a little uh, the patches here, they pass the dam and they irrigate uh, what we would call the free software project. In the case of most uh, free software project, it's just one guy who receives the GitHub pull request and he says, hmm, okay, I accept it. In the case of OpenStack, it's much more structured than that because you have this Garrett review process where it catches the patch and then Jenkins comes in, the robot testing the patch against the current master, the current trunk. And then only you have a human being coming in, uh, the patch was caught, Jenkins is happy, the core reviewer says, okay, I'm also happy, and then it passes the gate. So in any case, the upstream is this, people. Even with OpenStack where it's mostly automated. The upstream has been for the past uh, 15 years, the graal of every company and every individual. Everybody wants to be an upstream. OpenStack is the most magnificent example of a successful upstream project. It's very impressive, it has Thousands of contributors. But it's also something that is very complicated to achieve. Excuse me. There. Okay. Here. It's also something that is very complicated to achieve. 
But when you want to chase contributors as an upstream, you need about 1,000 users to have maybe one potential contributor. So you need to do a lot of marketing. I see here you are in marketing. Uh, to actually attract a contributor. And it poses problems then when you don't attract enough contributors, when you, when you cannot be an upstream and you are forced to use other upstream projects. That's where Dave Neary talked about uh, the cost of going it alone uh, comes into play when a company takes an upstream project inside and then forgets that there is an upstream and try to make patches internally, forgets to contribute them back, it's seen as a drawback of not being an upstream. So a company, a very big company, a very successful company, they want to be upstreams. So it's the dream of every individual, it's the dream of every company. And to be honest, it has also been my dream at some point. What I did uh, is during seven years, I created uh, poker software. There is no uh, poker software that is free software. I love free software. So I went there and I made cool uh, 3D clients, as this one, in a very hostile environment where everybody was talking about proprietary software. And I tried to recruit contributors, and I was successful in recruiting contributors, so I felt really good about myself. Uh, I also made a living, we paid up to 10 salaries. So by the free software standards, by the book that it was written by Carl Fogel, producing uh, open source software, uh, it was a success. Of, of course, not, nobody here heard about that. But for the 10, 20, 50 people involved in that, it was a successful free software project. I was happy to be an upstream. Then I stopped because one of my clients proposed to pay the invoice with a bag of money in the subway at midnight, and I decided that it was time for a change. And after seven years, uh, I didn't know exactly what to do. So I decided to spend a year uh, traveling the world of free software. That is, as quit the dream of being an upstream and explore the world of being a contributor. What's magical about free software is that you can do that every day. So I went, actually I looked at my screen, I say, okay, I'm using OpenStreetMap. So I go to the OpenStreetMap project, I look up the how to contribute page, and I go to the IRC channel, I talk to people, find a bug because I am a developer, I work the day fixing this low-hanging fruit, and by the end of the day, I finish it up, and I say, okay, bye. I, like the people farming during the summer, I go to ne the next field, and I will help for another day. Didn't always work like that, because for instance, a low-hanging fruit in LibreOffice turned out to be a two-month uh, really big assignment. But all in all, during a full year, I went from project to project, and it was a very rewarding experience. If you compare that to the pain I had to go when I was an upstream, trying to attract people to be my contributors, to live the upstream dream, being a contributor, I was hitting all the time. I was the dream come true for every upstream project I went to. They welcome me, they have not seen a contributor for a month. Then I arrive, I contribute something. Of course, it always works. So I went from the world of being an upstream to the world of being a contributor, and it was so much easier. Then I got involved in OpenStack. And it was uh, beginning of last year. And so I started working on it uh, as a contributor also, and I attended my first summit. When I went there, I saw a huge number of people. I've never seen that many uh, people being contributors, potential contributors. 
it was also striking to see that a lot of them didn't manage to contribute for some reason. There, there was that all these discussions, people were in the summit and they were discussing about the fact that they didn't manage to have their code be uh, upstreamed, but still they, they had the proper tools. Uh, they, they knew how to develop. Also, in a lot of projects I saw, the manager had to be convinced that they had to, uh, to, to give them permission to contribute. In the case of OpenStack, as you very well know, all the uh, companies give permission, they even order their developers to upstream something. But for some reason, it was not enough. And I was looking for the problem. I, I told myself, it's bizarre. During a year before that, I went from project to project, and it was not uncommon to see that you had five developers working on the code base. Only one of them got the, uh, the patch upstream. It was kind of common. What was striking last April was to see so many developers. So the magnitude of the project made me think and, uh, about that there was a problem. But since I couldn't find, I couldn't point any problem, everybody, uh, and in, in this room, uh, I think he, you see what I, uh, what I was looking for. And then I realized, most naturally, that there was no problem. Everybody can become a contributor, a successful contributor. That's what happens eventually. Let's take the example of someone from a large company used during 10 years uh, working on proprietary software, all of a sudden going to OpenStack. There is an adjustment to be made. It will, eventually, it will be made. But in the meantime, while well, there is some frustration, uh, you're looking about ways to communicate with people who are not your colleagues. They, uh, you see them every six months during the summit, and that's it. So there is an adjustment to be made. So we, I, I'm back with the image of the dam. There, was, there still are these many developers with many patches behind the dam. Only a few going through because it takes time to adjust. And eventually, it will look like that. It will flow so much faster in 10 years, in maybe in 20 years. But could we get there faster, maybe? Instead of just waiting to become better at contributing, could we do something to get better, to be better contributor, to contribute faster? When you get your patch rejected once or twice, could you reduce that to just one? One rejection instead of two? Maybe one week? spent in negotiating a blueprint as opposed to two months. That would be a big improvement. Your manager would be happy, you would be happy. So I went to look for training programs because uh, I'm no genius. So whenever I have an idea, I assume everybody thought about it before and that I will discover a training program. I asked Richard Stallman, who is a friend and travels all over the world, speaks to a lot of people about free software, getting better at free software, asking him, is there a training program I could use to become a better contributor, to learn new tricks, to, uh, to be faster? He didn't know of any. I asked uh, to Dave Neary, who is very passionate about communities and who he would know if there was a training program. But none of them, I asked Stefano also, who was there at the time, say, oh, there must be something. Uh, but there was nothing. If you know about a training program of that kind, I want to hear it. Please come to me or raise your hand. But at the time, in, uh, last April, we didn't find any. So we decided uh, with all the people on this wall uh, to make a training program just to become better contributors. 
Making the training program was a little tricky, so I will uh, shortly explain what I mean by a very simple contribution and what I mean by a very complex contribution, salometer, namely. So William Oprandi is a student of the Université du Littoral uh, in the north of France, and he was trained back in November with, uh, by Upstream University. It was his first contribution to OpenStack. The class he was in, for half of them, they have never contributed anything to free software. So for them, it was really the first step. And in order for the first step to be a success, to uh, give them uh, a taste of what it's like to be a free software contributor, we picked a very simple OpenStack bug. OpenStack because it's the most welcoming uh, community I know in the world, and a very simple uh, so that there is no technical difficulty associated to it. So as you can see, it was about replacing uh, Nova Volume with Cinder, a simple typo. Of course, he succeeded in doing that uh, quite shortly, but he had to go through all the process of being a contributor. All of a sudden, within a few hours of work, for William, being a free software contributor changed from just being an idea to being actually something he has done. Moreover, he, he could be uh, proud to say, I contributed to one of the biggest uh, free software projects in existence now. I'm a, an OpenStack contributor. Actually, this is not the simplest contribution he could have made. Answering uh, with a link to a question on a mailing list. So as someone asks, uh, ah, how can I contribute to OpenStack? So you send the link to the how to contribute page. That's a valid contribution, but it's not a contribution that requires permission from upstream. So one of the difficulty, one of the power of the contributor is that at some point, you get your work, you give it to someone who is the upstream, and this someone takes it forever. If you disappear, then the code will leave, will outlive you. More difficult than a single patch is a blueprint. So that's why we are all here uh, during the summit. We have ideas, and we want to convince people that they are worthy of being implemented. And this is something that is not just technical. Of course, if you're trying to convince someone that a blueprint is worth implementing, you better have development skills or someone with you with development skills to make it happen. Otherwise, uh, it will stay something that is just an idea. And then there is, in my mind, the most difficult the, uh, contribution of all, which would be to change the project governance. For instance, switching from a Rackspace project to an OpenStack Foundation project. This is the kind of contribution you, ca you can make to a free software project. It requires dedication, takes years. This is extraordinarily difficult. And more uh, reachable, there is the example I want to give you, which is Sailometer. So I will shortly describe how Sailometer came to existence. Back in March 2012, I was with uh, Nicolas Barset. At the time, I was employed by Innovance, and Nicolas Barset was employed by Canonical. All of that changed, as I suppose for most of you. And we had this problem that uh, we needed metering. We, we needed to know how much uh, resources OpenStack used, not just in theory, but precisely. And there was no component doing that. Moreover, we saw that it was not something that you could implement just as an external component. It was something that required every component to cooperate together. So it was more than a blueprint. It was something that had architectural uh, consequences. And Possibly, at the time, we said maybe it could be a core component, maybe not. So we went to the summit with a blueprint, which was kind of modest because we wanted something much bigger than a blueprint, but how do you convey an idea uh, within the OpenStack community if not with a blueprint? And we talked to a lot of people, 
And uh, we had to uh, change a myth that was, oh, you're speaking about billing. No, we're not speaking about billing. Billing is something completely different. Billing requires metering, but we're speaking about metering. Oh, really? Because this billing software also does metering, or there already is some measurement coming on the, on the bus, etc. So we, we spent a lot of time, even before trying to implement, to convince people that the idea was worth it. And to be honest, we realized during the summit by talking to people that we were not quite right. So the idea actually shifted, of course. But when we did that, we also acknowledged, as I said before, that we had to have the workforce to make it happen. So in this uh, specific situation, Innovance had one employee who could be assigned to the work, and Canonical had no one, but we had one employee. So when we went to the summit, I knew that my company could dedicate technical resources to make it happen. As soon as the summit was finished, Julien Danjou, who is now the PTL of Cellometer, started working, started implementing code. And he was soon joined uh, by Doug uh, Hellman from DreamHost, and together they created the software that is now known as Sailometer. Now I could go on on the story, but the point is you can see the gap there is between William O'Prandi contribution and Sailometer contribution. Sailometer can also be seen as an upstream now because some people contribute to Sailometer, but if you take OpenStack as a whole, it is a contribution and a large one. So, to, how do you train to implement larger contributions faster and in a more easy way? If you are William O'Prandi, do you wait 20 years or can you train? So we tried to design the training program as I showed before. William O'Pandy did not try to make something theoretical. He worked on an actual bug. So before the training, what every student does is pick a contribution that matters to him. So this weekend, for instance, we had uh, students for a session and each of them had a different contribution to work on. The goal of the training is to get the contribution upstream. So we work on an actual case. The first day of the training is live. And what we do in the morning is we go over the contribution process. It comes from uh, how to contribute, who are you going to talk to, what are the technical difficulties, et cetera, up to uh, the end of the process. When we go over this process, again, it's not in theory. Every student uh, tries to apply the process to his own contribution. How will that work? Who will I talk to? Can I expect difficulties? And in the, in the afternoon, after this uh, theoretical uh, display, applying to the actual contribution, we go in simulation mode using Legos. So Legos is kind of the, used by agile training all over the world. It's a very useful tool where uh, you do sprints and you learn to work collaboratively. It is adapted for upstream work because you always have a con conflict between the agenda of your company and the agenda of the upstream. If it's not your company, it could be your own agenda or the agenda of a nonprofit you, uh, you are involved with. In any case, you always have to manage as a team member, as a contributor, you have to manage uh, an overlap between your company agenda and the upstream agenda. If you're looking at contributing to OpenStack and there is no overlap, the patch gets rejected by, the, uh, by OpenStack over and over, you must question yourself. Maybe you're not in the right place. Maybe you're contributing to the wrong project. 
So after this first day, we actually get to work. So the second day of the training is we make the contribution. We, everybody, uh, every student works on his contribution. First, by making a plan. So we, we take the process. They had the night to think about it. And they make 11 slides explaining how they will go about their contribution and what they will improve. In the case of someone who is a, already a proficient contributor, the goal of this training is to get better at it. If you already know how to patch, uh, maybe there is something you can improve that will increase the number of patch you can upstream. Maybe if it takes you two weeks, you can reduce it to one week. And in the afternoon, we move to the online part of the program. So in order to do an actual contribution, the problem is you cannot squeeze that in two days unless you, uh, you make a huge work with the PTL to make sure they are available during the, um, during the training to approve the patch. That wouldn't fly. An actual patch takes weeks to be accepted because the interaction just takes a long time. So after these two days, we do a number of online sessions, one hour online sessions, where the student comes back to the mentor and says, okay, this is what I've done with the contribution and it went fairly well on this and this aspect. This is what I plan to do. And here people train in Agile where we recognize the stand-up meetings or the daily meetings. Uh, and this didn't quite work out, uh, and that's it. 15 minutes, time boxed. And then the next 45 minutes is dedicated to how can you improve the way you contribute? Maybe how can you work on a contribution that uh, you've never done before, and you have to tackle difficulties that you're completely uh, unused to? So that's basically the training program. It applies to every individual at every level. Because as you uh, already realized right now, it's much more about being coached, being trained to do that, being better at it, rather than learning a specific technique. Something you don't do on your own. I know I don't. When I take time with someone else to reflect on how I can improve myself, that works. When I try to just sit by myself, I go and do something else. And it also does not only apply to OpenStack. The first students we actually trained were uh, Linux kernel developers. They came from a company where they were used to work on a, a proprietary uh, Unix kernel. And I will not name the company. And uh, it, it was a complete cultural shift for them to go to uh, Linux, to understand the community. And also the community of the Linux kernel, as you well know, is not as welcoming as OpenStack. It's much more difficult to get accepted. So they had to uh, consciously work on their social skills to blend in. So finally, we already, uh, we have courses now, and they address, uh, as I said, students in the university, University of Littoral uh, last year. This year, University of Littoral will again train uh, students. And the University of Toulouse uh, will open a slot for this program in their computer science uh, department. So to teach first uh, computer science uh, students how to contribute. And if you are a teacher or a student and you want that in your university, uh, Upstream University can provide all the material uh, you need, uh, even uh, make the first course so that you, you know how to replicate it. Because Upstream University is a nonprofit, it's not for profit. Yet it has to be sustainable because uh, sometimes I give the course like I did this weekend, but uh, 
when I don't have time, uh, someone, Adolfo Brandes, for instance, is paid to do it, or Rodolphe Quedeville, who recently joined, also give courses, and he gets paid. So companies can, for a fee, send uh, people who want to get better at contributing to upstream university. And because it's a, a non-profit, of course, if you're an individual and your manager does not want to hear about uh, upstream university and getting better at uh, contributing, you can take a, uh, your weekend. So we organize a weekend training for individuals for free. And if you are crazy enough to spend your weekend training for free, then you have it. And that's all I have for you. And now we have a few minutes, I believe, for uh, questions if uh, you have any. How long did I take? OK. Any questions? Nope. Yes. Oh, yes. Please use the mic. Uh, you can, uh, I'm sorry about that, but it's recorded. Thanks. All right. He passed it to me. That's better. Um, so that's really <laughs> Uh, so, uh, have you talked to Steph or um, Mark Collier about how to integrate this with the certification program that they're working on? No. Okay. Steph, you mean Stefano? Stefano, yeah. Yeah, but I will. Okay. That, okay. that would be great. Thank you it, for uh, the tip. Yes. Okay. Um, so, uh, have you uh, done any work um, or had any discussions about with any of the user groups and how um, there's a you know, there's different types of people that show up. There's the, the raw beginners that are just showing up to find out what it's about, but there's also a, a contingent, usually around you know, 10 to 20 percent, who want to learn how to, um, how to become OpenStack developers. Yeah. Uh, no, I didn't. What I found to be very difficult is to tell people, you're not able to do that. I will teach you how to do that. The fact is, uh, contributing to OpenStack is so easy that anybody can do it. So uh, I should, uh, yes, talk to the user groups. Maybe uh, Tim would be uh, the guy to talk to. Yeah, or me. Or you, OK. Yeah. I, I run the San Francisco Bay Area. OK. Groups. So to, um, to offer uh, training courses uh, to get better at contributing, which works, yes. Because uh, we've been working on um, in, and uh, haven't quite finished it, and I'd be interested in talking to you about it, how to put together a hackathon, which is basically a syllabus for training new developers. Not only okay. insourcing them, uh, getting them up, and so they, they know the basics a little bit more than just reading a, a wiki page, but actually uh, you know, uh, steps like you would for a university course. But also uh, keeping them occupied right after that point. So um, do you give them a blueprint? Do you give them a list of, of uh, you know, get the high 10, high priority bugs and um, ideally do it in a collaborative environment like a user group. So people keep showing up week after week and they start to know each other. And, you know, and there you can off. get peer-to-peer uh, -peer participation and the people exactly. are in the same area so it works better. Yeah, yeah that's Gets them over the really hump nice and, and actually uh, for some there's a big uh, um, fear factor about getting onto IRC or the mailing list and, and actually putting yourself out there and getting yeah. over that. And during the live training, we get over that very easily. But uh, as you say, there, there is a fear factor if you do it on your own. If you're with other people, then it comes naturally. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. That's, that's all Thank I you Thank for you. these two ideas. Yes. OK, great. Anyone? Yes? Uh. Hi. Um, well, I'm interested in what is, what was the, your biggest challenge making like Cellometer into getting into accepting in the open stack. Uh, I know for a fact that uh, contributing to the open source is like a more like a social skill, starting with a simple patches and getting the into community to know you or something. But then when, uh, as you said, contributing to somewhere somewhere else dreams is easy. But yeah. how do you make Everybody else inspire to people. your dream. Yeah. Well, actually, Sailometer started by uh, people accepting that we had a dream that we will work on it on our own. That is, they, they will not refuse that we make our dream real reality. 
So it was easy in that respect. In order to move forward, we didn't have to ask to, to get consensus. We could move without consensus. And the consensus went as, as we moved. We grew more code. We got more people on board. So it's an ongoing process. This part was not too difficult. But what was the biggest challenge, I don't know, because it's many moving parts. We can see now that Sailometer succeeded in a time frame that couldn't be optimized. So we, we did a lot of things right. And despite the wrong things that you, we did, uh, it went well. But if we had to explain, oh, you have to do that, this is the recipe to do that, I couldn't know. And the bigger the contribution is, the less uh, it's likely that you have a recipe. It's, it worked, and that's all I can say. It was not, there was nothing really complex. Yeah. Thanks. Anyone? Okay. Thank you for listening.